I'm Sunil Kilmani. I'm the director of the India Institute here at King's College in London. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Before I turn to this evening's occasion, uh, can I just remind you that we have another public event tomorrow evening, also at 5.30, uh, and that's a panel discussion on democracy in India at 70. Uh, and it's a really terrific lineup. I can tell you it includes N. Ram, the editor of the Hindu newspaper and group, uh, Professor Suhas Palshikar of Pune University, Professor Kanchan Chandra of NYU, and our own Christoph Jaffrelo and Louise Tillen. Uh, and this is all part of a week of back-to-back -back conferences here at the Institute, um, which has included over the past couple of days a really excellent graduate conference, which has been organized by our students. And, and, and many of the participants at that graduate conference are here this evening, so good to see you. Um, so to this evening, um, at the India Institute, we aim to bring our research on contemporary India which we pursue through a multiplicity of disciplinary and intellectual perspectives, we aim to bring that research into the public domain and to engage with the issues of the day through the lens of scholarship and thought. And as we do so, we draw inspiration from a tradition of public intellectuals in India who themselves combined, I think in exemplary ways, rigorous research, independent thought, and active public engagement. And as our small homage to that tradition, we've established a series of annual lectures to honor the memory of some of its notable exponents. Um, as for instance, so we have the MN Srinivas Memorial Lecture. Tonight's lecture is the fifth in memory of one of the foremost historians and liberal minds of modern India, Dr. Sarvapali Gopal. He was born in 1926, and in a career that stretched almost five decades, he established himself as an outstanding historical biographer uh, and a political historian, an initiator and meticulous editor of major editions of documentary and archival sources, and a public intellectual who moved in the corridors of power and published in the popular press. Beginning his career with studies of British colonial rule and policy, Dr. Gopal, as he was always known, went on to write a three-volume biography of Nehru, which remains a landmark. And indeed, as the first editor of the selected works of Jawaharlal Nehru, he shaped, I think, one of the most significant published sources for understanding modern India's history. As professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University, and indeed he was one of the founders of the School of Historical Studies there, and as a fellow of St. Anthony's College, Oxford, Dr. Gopal also mentored a generation of historians and helped to define a research agenda for the study of modern history, modern Indian history. But he was, as I say, also unusually not just an academic historian. He had a career in government. He helped to create the historical division within the Ministry of External Affairs, and he directed that division's activities for over a decade. Uh, he was closely involved in the boundary dispute with China, he oversaw major government publications. And all of that was rooted in his deep interest in India's international relations and policy, and his understanding of it over a very long span from Curzon to Indira Gandhi. We've been lucky in the early years of this lecture in Gopal's memory to have had some of the most distinguished historians of India and also Indian diplomats as our speakers. The first lecture, lectures were delivered um, by the late Professor Sir Christopher Bailey and Professor Ramila Thapar. Other speakers have include, uh, included Ambassador Nirupma Rao, uh, India's former Foreign Secretary and Ambassador to Washington, and also Prasenjit Dwara from the National University at Singapore. So let me turn now to this evening's lecture and introduce our speaker. And really, in almost every way to a room full of people who think and work about India, Sudipta Kaviraj needs little introduction. Over the past four decades and more, his writings on politics, on literature, on social theory, on intellectual history have illuminated each one of those fields and indeed all of them together. And I think they've helped so many of us to see better what there is to understand in the Indian experience and why it matters to the world. Professor Kaviraj is the author of many, many works, including books. He's above all, I think, a master of the intellectual essay, uh, many of which have been collected in a recent three-volume edition published by Permanent Black. Uh, 
Both he and Dr. Gopal shared a liking for expressing complex and important thoughts in compelling and graceful literary style, a quality that I think is sadly forgotten in today's professionalized world of mindless excellence frameworks. Professor Kaviraj began his academic career at JNU, at Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, as a colleague of Dr. Gopal's. He taught at SOAS for several years at Chicago, and he's currently professor of Indian politics and intellectual history at Columbia University in the city of New York. And I really feel privileged that he's agreed to give this lecture. Since it's a formal lecture, we'll not take questions after, but you're all invited to a reception immediately afterwards in the room next door uh, to meet with him and to converse with him more informally. His title this evening is Nehru as a Theorist of the International Order. Sudipto. Thank you, Sunil, for this uh, very generous introduction. <clears throat> and um, it's a great honor and uh, pleasure for me to come back to London, where I've spent a long time teaching at SOAS, <clears throat> to talk about Professor Gopal, uh, which also reminds me of my very pleasurable time uh, in JNU. I taught in JNU for 20 years, and uh, Professor Gopal was my colleague. I, don't, I can't say that I knew him extremely well intellectually because he was one of the senior most uh, members of the faculty and I was one of the junior most faculties in uh, JNU. <clears throat> but we had a common interest in Nehru, approaching him from two different angles. And uh, I was intrigued by the fact that uh, when he wrote his massive and I think authoritative biography of Nehru, he decided to make a reference to something that I had written on Nehru, which was partly a kind of, not entirely lighthearted, but it was a kind of partly lighthearted exchange, mostly among Marxists, <clears throat> about Nehru's uh, historical assessment. What I'm going to present to you today is not a field on which I normally write. I'm basically by training <coughs> a student of political theory. Um, and what I'm going to present today, I have derived uh, from a lot of reading of people like Professor Gopal, but I've also learned a lot from two people who are in the audience today who know much more about Nehru historically than I do. One is my wife, Nilanjana, who did her PhD on Nehru's foreign policy. <coughs> and many of the things that I have talked about here started appearing to me, or I started thinking about those when we had conversations about what she found in the library and things like that. And the other person, of course, is Sunil Kildani. I have known Sunil for a very, very long time. And uh, I've always complained, and I want to register my complaint here formally. <coughs> Again, Sunil not writing the biography of Nehru that he has promised us endlessly. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is <coughs> not to talk about the historical side of Nehru's foreign policy. I'll basically argue that there are three important ideas uh, of political theory, which are in their very nature profound theoretical ideas, which I think Nehru was one of the first to grasp and outline. And <coughs> um, it would be important for political theorists, both in India and elsewhere, to try to pick up his intuitions and try to elaborate them and uh, work out the implications of those ideas. So that's essentially what I'm trying to do. So against our general belief that theory is produced in the West and passively or faultily consumed in the rest of the world, I wish to argue that third world leaders often had significant theoretical intuitions. The Western academia, because it's content to know so little about the world, did not take them seriously as theoretical ideas, which is not very surprising. The Indian academia, which is more surprising, treated them with disdain due to its firm colonial belief that we were destined by history to, the under, to be the under laborers of social theory. <clears throat> Despite their generally pleasing prose, Nehru's writings, I think, lacks the pointedness and precision of Gandhi's often. But there was one field which he analyzed all his life with unfailingly close attention, the global political order. 
I find three remarkable ideas in Nehru's reflections on the international order, at least two of which I think are very seriously theoretical. After the Second World War, when Nehru slowly worked out India's line in foreign relations, it was not seen as original, only idiosyncratic and unusual. <clears throat> but oddity and originality shared the characteristic of being singular, <coughs> of being different from what is done or thought in common practice. The condemnation of the oddness of Nehru's policy was, in my view, an indirect and unclear recognition of its originality. Indian foreign policy of non-alignment was characterized in several standard ways by diplomatic and academic observers, including Indians. One particular view, which could have an uncharitable and a charitable form, saw it as an instance of an unrealistic pursuit of high ideals, probably influenced by long, unworldly religious traditions in India, in a world which was driven entirely and justifiably by purely instrumental national self-interest. The idea that every nation had a clear set of unambiguous, had a set of clear and unambiguous cluster of self-interest in international life is at best simplistic, but it exerted a deep influence on international relations thinking for a long time, to such an extent that it was given the noble title of the realistic theory of international relations, in particular in the American academia. Those of us who went to college in the 60s and studied political science must remember the infliction of these constitutive banalities through Hans Morgenthau's textbook, which, de which was declared as a high theoretical observation, that states tended to, see, tended to seek ways to increase their power and use that to pursue their self-interest in the world. It did not help clarify <coughs> our mystification about whether <clears throat> following a policy of peace towards neighbors or trying to bring them under your dominance was in our evident self-interest, though US practice seemed to indicate the latter. <clears throat> to this theory, non-alignment was bound to look like a disaster. This meant that either that the Indian state followed unrealistic goals or it actually did not but suffered from self-delusion. A second version was less complimentary <clears throat> it believed that non-alignment was a betrayal of modern political principles. Both sides in the Cold War were convinced that it was engaged in an epochal battle of principles between demands of equality and of freedom. <clears throat> Not taking sides in such a context of ultimate principles was a betrayal of high principles of all kinds. India's rivals in particular derided the policy as one of extreme opportunism not really not taking sides in the great ideological conflict of our times, but trying to bargain for advantage in a purely high-minded ethical conflict. This high ideological view, of course, produced an astonishing alchemy. It could turn explicitly military or dictatorial governments, like Pakistan or Iran at the time, into fighters for the free world. <clears throat> commitment to freedom was not tested by internal principles, but by declared commitment to the West, which defended and held up principles of a free society, a sort of ethics by contagion. Faced with such criticism, Nehru's responses were surprisingly tame. <clears throat> when critics accused him of contracting unworldly idealism from Gandhi, Nehru rather unclearly offered an argument that underscored the originality of Gandhi's politics with an emphasis on the contradictory reality of Gandhi's truth. He was in one sense an entirely idealistic agent who did not reconcile himself to the structures of existing political power, but wanted to reshape that world according to his desires. Instead of confronting the world, conforming to the world like great transformative figures, he wanted the world to conform to his dictates. <clears throat> Equally, Gandhi succeeded because his politics was in another sense highly realistic. I think Nehru noted that. We do not understand Gandhi if we do not see in the significance the significance and the force of his realism. <clears throat> I think the same is true of Nehru in international politics. This is something that I have realized only recently. But unlike Gandhi, Nehru's writing did not state his analytics explicitly. There is a slightly Hegelian aspect to this argument. To be effective, the agent has to analyze and understand the structuring of the real. Only then can he use it and bend it to his purposes. Structures do not disappear, but strangely, bend to intelligent action only if the acts work according to its internal logic. <clears throat> the outlines of the justification are familiar, disavowing the charge that he was pursuing a policy influenced by high religious principle, unlikely to succeed in a world of pure pursuit <clears throat> of power. Nehru strove to prov provide a justification for the hard combination that he sought to effect between high principles and hard realism. 
<coughs> in his recurrent observations about the post-war world, he states two claims with clarity and rhetorical force. <coughs> he did not accept the framing of the state of the world in terms of the two high, de high ideal pictures. Either the American picture that the world would be safe for democracy under their hegemonic leadership only if it was not obstructed by the totalitarian designs of communists led by Moscow, or the Soviet one that the world would become a great utopian commonwealth of equality only if imperial structures of capitalist production could be entirely dismantled. <coughs> he acknowledged that the two high ideals were the great regulative ideals of, on offer to mankind, and both had compelling ethical force. But the policies of the two superpowers, which heralded the end of a world of great powers, were too inconsistent to be respected as entirely disinter disinterested pursuit of high ideals. Western powers seem to him to intend to retain a basically post-colonial world in which only the formal structures of political sovereignty were amended, <clears throat> but they retained control over the economic and social destiny of non-European peoples. To act rightly in this world, therefore, could not be in deciding which high ideal was the best and to side with the military pact that sought to realize that essentially fraudulent dream. The capitalist world was based on the injustice of economic exploitation and dependency, and the communist world was based on blatant political subjection of East European states to Soviet dominance. The crisis of Suez and Hungary occurring in the same year illustrated this paradox. To act rightly was therefore not to accept the setting of the question of right and wrong in those precise terms of a cataclysmic conflict between freedom and equality, but to try to come to a judgment on individual cases of conflict. This risked the charges of inconsistency and opportunism <clears throat> because in some instances India might decide uh, in favor of one side and in some others in favor of the other. Nehru's intellectual efforts were primarily focused on this particular point to argue that where others would see a policy of inconsistency, it was actually the only consistent way of acting rightly in the wrongly constructed world that had come out of the war. The Indian state occupied a position similar to that of the heroes of modern novels. Initially, it might appear that there was something wrong with the hero because he could not reconcile himself to the world around him. But eventually, when the story ended, we realized that there was something wrong with the world, not the hero. <coughs> Although Nehru did not use a language we would call theoretical in academic prose, I want to suggest that he could not have taken these positions without a clear stance on some fundamental theoretical issues. First, he rejected the framing of the question itself of what was at stake in the conflicts around the world. Secondly, he suggested that although political action, even by state agents, not just individuals and groups, had something to do with political ideals, the actual working of ideals was far muddier and murkier than the mythologies of the two sides implied. We have to work with a far more complex theoretical understanding of the relation between ethics and politics and understand the always contingent, always imperfect, always provisional translation of a language of ethics into the alien but connected language of politics. <clears throat> the eventual history of non-alignment would reveal the standard trajectory of a highly original idea. Initially, when it's proposed, everybody condemns it as insane or unreasonable. After its success becomes incontrovertible, everybody says that they thought so too, but for some reason kept it to themselves. In the end, <clears throat> non-alignment became so attractive that it was joined even by countries like Pakistan and Cuba, making it both triumphant and meaningless. Now I want to turn to three ideas which seem to me to be profoundly important and implicit in Nehru's statecraft, but which he did not articulate in theoretical terms. But Minerva's owl flies out at dusk, so it's not surprising. Political conditions under which agents act sometimes obscure their own understanding of what they're doing. <clears throat> Nehru had an unusually deep curiosity about the structure of the world political order. I emphasize the term structure, <clears throat> which set him aside from other nationalist leaders. Few other leaders of the national movement took interest in international events or sought, like him, to understand not just what was happening locally, but how significant events were going to alter the structure of the global order itself. This deep and alert sense of realism must have led him to mistrust a picture of the post-war global order, which became a surprisingly consensual orthodoxy among political agents and observers. <clears throat> Since he has observed and analyzed global events before the war, it was easy for him to see that what was previously a balance of power system of a number of great powers, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, the US, 
Russia, Turkey, Japan, and China, of course in unequal degrees, <clears throat> had been fundamentally restructured into a new system of what was called bipolarity. Devastated by the war, <coughs> major European powers, strangely, including UK and Germany, had become dependent on, <coughs> on American support in crucial ways. This was counterbalanced by Soviet Union's dominance over the resources of Eastern Europe and China's vast and unrealized potential. This general picture was clear and acceptable to nearly all observers, but it could be refined in two quite distinct ways, with highly significant implications for political practice and state policy. <clears throat> Despite their irreconcilable, irreconcilable ideological difference, the American and the Soviet sides endorsed a deep cognitive consensus. This is something which impresses me. They sought to convince the rest of the world that the nature of the world order was bipolar, this had two implications. First, that all observers were to accept cognitively that the bipolar picture was correct. And second, if that picture was accurate, it bore the political implication that other states had no option but to follow the initiatives of one of the two blocs and their leading states. Nehru offered against this a picture of what I would call asymmetric bipolarity, he rejected both the cognitive and the practical implications of the remarkable joint claim, paradoxically the only point on which the communists and the Western bloc firmly agreed. <coughs> Contrary to the dominant and convergent picture of the world order, as symmetrically bipolar, Nehru's analysis was premised on an asymmetric bipolarity. The structure of the order had to be described in two steps. The first step was to recognize the end of the old balance of power system, the two superpowers were so disproportionately powerful against all others that the world had indeed become bipolar in a general sense. But the distance in power between the first two and the rest of the pack does not necessarily mean equivalence between the two major powers themselves. This is where Nehru, in my view, had a dissenting and more accurate picture of the post-war world. The Western system of states was far more powerful in economic, political, and probably in military terms than the Soviets. <coughs> The structure of options open to the two superpowers and their manner of approaching decisions were therefore dissimilar. Other states could play them more effectively, that is the superpowers, if they understood and in their turn played on that asymmetry. The introduction of a quality of asymmetry of power transforms the manner in which the bipolar system is viewed. We can analyze this a little abstractly by imagining a field of players marked by asymmetry of dominance. A and B are the dominant powers, uh, you know, proxies for US and the Soviet Union. <coughs> and the rest of the alphabet are ordinary states which have to cope somehow with the fact of this inequality of resources. <coughs> Asymmetry in bipolarity alters the assumption that the two superordinate powers would, will act upon the world and towards other states in the same way. If bipolarity was symmetrical, which was the standard interpretation, we could expect a symmetry, that is similarity, in the power behavior of the two dominant states in their objectives, strategies, and tactics would parallel each other. In an asymmetric system, if both A and B wish to influence C, let us say India, <coughs> their objectives and expectations would vary. A would try to get C, that is the first dominant power would try to get a non-dominant power, to do what it wants, that is, A wants, <coughs> and use pressures and inducements to achieve that. If C actually acts in, in a way that is at variance with the exact way in which A wants it to, A will view that as a failure of its policy. A's behavior or expectations are in that sense maximalist. As B is conscious of either its inferiority in power or its disadvantage at this starting point, that is, while A is sitting on an already existing pattern of dominance historically, B is trying to alter and destabilize that and construct a newly equilibrium. So it actually puts that in a historically inferior position, also, although I use the term inferior in a peculiar sense. <coughs> so B will rarely either demand or expect of C that it would act in a way that B wants. Rather, if it can get C to act in a way that is different from what A wants it to do, B would regard that as a success. Its objectives are sub-maximum. 
I'm not suggesting that the US and the Soviet Union understood this and simply dissembled to persuade others to adopt a picture of simple bipolarity. Since the nature of power is experimental, states are agents which seek the lineaments of such structures by taking action and recursively monitoring their consequences. I think Nehru understood this truth in a Hegelian fashion, precisely because he was a slave responding not to one, but two masters, and living by intelligence in a world that was not under his control. This experimental intelligence in foreign policy gradually gave him a picture of the real structure of the international order that was more reliable than of the dominant paradigm of those times. <clears throat> Without an analytics of this kind, it's impossible to explain the increasing connection between the Soviets and India after Stalin's death. The common turn under Stalin's leadership demanded loyalty in a strict bipolar form. Since Nehru, despite his socialist ideological sympathies, decisively rejected military alliances, Soviet Union during his time denounced Nehru in their ringing language as a running hound of Western imperialist states. <clears throat> American elites were equally hostile to Nehru's initial state-building initiatives. Dulles famously declared that those who are not with us are against us, and it was clear, I hope it's not mine, no, it's not mine. <coughs> I don't know my ring very well. <laughs> So American elites were equally hostile to Nehru's initial state-building initiatives. Dulles famously declared that those who are not with us are against us. And it was clear that American business elites and economic policymakers viewed Nehru's initial in initiatives towards heavy industrialization under state jurisdiction as a proto-socialist program of nationalization and decided against serious investments in the Indian economy. After the famous visit by Khrushchev and Bulganin, Cooperation between India and the Soviet Union expanded rapidly in economic and military spheres, utterly defying the logic of an ideologically bipolar order. This was an extraordinary instance of the communist Soviet Union providing crucial assistance in capital and technology to a government which was clearly not communist in its political character, which did not plan to submit to a Soviet sphere of influence like the states of Eastern Europe, and which clearly presided over the creation of a large, highly diversified, but recognizably capitalist economy. <clears throat> On the Soviet side, too, these developments must have been startling and defied standard explanations, which is why important Soviet commentators like Rumiantsev proposed the ingenious but clearly counterintuitive idea that Nehru's government was beginning to follow what he called a non-capitalist path of development. That was squaring the circle in terms of conventional communist ideology. <clears throat> in fact, that episode in Indian history shows that it was in the Soviet Union's interest to encourage India's capitalist growth in independent terms, because it weakened American control over the non-communist world. Contrary to U.S. misgivings, Nehru's government was not drawing economic and military support from the communist power to construct communism or even a socialist economy of some description. But clearly, the success of Nehru's moves and its demonstration effect on other states softened the structure of bipolar control over the entire world. The lessons of this maneuver were not lost on other states, placed in a similar position inside the world order. And eventually, a large number of states decided to join what became, at the point of its glorious death, the non-aligned movement. I think the profound force of non-alignment came from a different source than it's usually believed. It was not its intransigent refusal to fall into one of the ideological camps that gave it its power in the real historical world, but an underlying epistemic breakthrough that although the world was asymmetrical, that the, that the world was asymmetrical, and it does not take much argument to establish that Nehru was singularly responsible for the capture of this truth. My second claim is more indirect, in the sense that Nehru never directly spoke about international society in those, these terms, but I am convinced that this was an essential and fundamental element of his view of the international order. <clears throat> but I think as his thinking evolved after the war, he gained experience in international politics by taking diplomatic action. Nehru grasped a different truth about the nature of this international order. This is not uh, asymmetric bipolarity. If the international order was not just a set of accidents, if it had a structure, because 
this reflects two different ways of looking at the international order. One is that it's simply a merely an unconnected series of incidents which need to be dealt with, or you can have a picture of the international order which thinks that it has a structure whose underlying tendencies have to be captured epistemically. <clears throat> so if it is not a set of accidents, if it had a structure, its major consequence was seen in the limits and constraints it placed on the intended actions of individual states. Structural constraints and limitations were precisely of this nature in case of economic relations. <clears throat> being part of a structure was here essentially of a matter of being subjected to restraints. Nehru's thinking on the structure of the political order, I think, was of a different kind because he saw the structure in the political context in, some, in a fundamentally different way. <clears throat> Political actions were constrained by objective conditions, like the size of the army, the capacity for military expenditure, or the par particular configuration of alliances of a state. But they were also crucially conditioned by what these actors cognitively accepted at the limits of their own agency. If the bipolar picture was universally accepted, if the picture was universally accepted, <clears throat> the states continued to act on that assumption, the world would indeed remain or become bipolar. To some significant extent, the real nature of the structure was dependent or continued by the nature of that belief or that imaginative picture. This was a serious emendation of the standard view of how the structures worked or the, relations between, or the relation between beliefs and states of affairs. In politics, under many circumstances, reality is constituted by belief. With the irresistible rise of neoliberal capitalism today and the vast influence of financial markets and institutions, economists often stress, this, stress a similar idea, <coughs> that structures are constituted by belief. The relation between political reality and belief is not external on this view, belief simply waiting upon a reality that is independent of it. It's often internal what people, political actors, believe to be the case indeed comes to be the case. I want to stress, stress that in the analysis of non-alignment, it's quite often recognized that the larger number of states joining the non-aligned movement increased the room for maneuver for individual states, specifically for new post-colonial countries. That is certainly true. But I want to stress that underlying that registration of a fact of international history lies a deeper realization that the international relations inside the world political order was also subject to this startling proposition about the nature of structures and the relationship of belief and facts inside it. And I think we can legitimately claim that Nehru was among the first to grasp this fundamental theoretical truth. <coughs> For my last point, I would use a notion from Marx, should not surprise you, at least in the <coughs> I think if Professor Gopal had been present, I think he would have said that it doesn't surprise me at all, <coughs> at least in the initial steps of my argument. This comes from one of the most familiar aspects of Marxist thinking, but I think I read it from a slightly uh, different angle, and is elaborated through the ideas of contradiction, if you use a Hegelian term, or class analysis, which is a more common term. But I'm not using class analysis in the standard sense. <coughs> I think Marx came upon this argument very early in his career. In its first clear elaboration is found in the fragment on estranged labor in the 1844 economic philosophical manuscripts. In modern social theory, this idea is seasonally stressed as anti-humanism, particularly in the fashion in which Foucault has derived it from Althusser's initial formulation. In the famous passage on exploitation of man by man, Marx, you would recall, uh, sets out four different forms of alienation. The first one is the exploitation of man, alienation of man from man. <coughs> Marx presents a series of asymmetries. And he says something like this, that if labor is degrading to the working man, to some other man, it must be his life's joy, etc. If we use techniques of literary reading of the passage, through the repetition of these profoundly significant experiences of human social life, Marx stresses that there's a single structure which requires the simultaneous presence and action of two groups. But they fail to produce a common experience. That's my central point. <coughs> the purpose of these rep rhetorical repetitions is to make explicit the background expectation against which Marx is making his point, that if people share a common structure of social life, they must have a common experience. Marx is making what I think is a basic but easily forgettable idea. Modern structures have a contradictory nature in this sense. <coughs> 
The concept of contradiction in Segel Marx's views captures the strange feature of his structure within quotes, bringing together groups and individuals into a common practice, like industrial production, but producing a systematically divergent, inequivalent experience of that structure in these groups. <coughs> in the end, it would be absurd to deny the existence of this structure and the common entanglement of different classes or groups in this singular frame. But it would also be absurd to ignore the fact that there is no common experience of this social fact. The experience is radically disjuncted and contradictory. To give you an illustration, I live in Manhattan, and people who sort of um, stack the shelves in the supermarket uh, in the house, in the building in which I live, they also live in Manhattan. And the simple but I think profound argument is that it, it tempts us to say that there's an experience of living in Manhattan. And the Marx argument is that there is no experience of living in Manhattan. The two people who live in Manhattan, of course, do. And there has to be a Manhattan which is structurally present you know, for that to happen. But our experience of what living in Manhattan is, is completely inequivalent. And <coughs> so that, I think, is the nature of a contradictory structure. That's what the term contradiction stresses. <coughs> that is why humanism technically, the use of the concept of man as a social inhabitant of the capitalist order is viciously misleading epistemically. Men do not live in a capitalist society, only capitalists and laborers do. If you say that men live in capitalist societies, you simply eradicate, you know, erase this difference, without which no truthful understanding of the capitalist order is possible. <coughs> Theoretical anti-humanism, Althusser's coinage, means refusing the allure of this well-meaning foundational picture of a social world of common interest. Instead, of, instead it produces a logic of estrangement in which neighbors live as strangers, collaborators exist as competitors, groups who are structurally interdependent become enemies, and it is emph emphatically a logic. It, if left unattended by other social means, this estrangement gets intensified. Inimical groups get alienated to the extent that they want to destroy each other, which they cannot do without destroying the common world. I think you will actually hear echoes of, you know, daily rhetorical uh, speeches by Donald Trump in this kind of picture. <coughs> Besides the detailed argument in Marx that shows this to be the case with the capitalist economy, I think there's a vaguer suggestion in Marx himself that modernity in general, not just the capitalist economy, is filled with similar contradictory structures. We find two strands of Marx's thought um, going in entirely to two entirely opposite cognitive movements about what to do with this initial insight. One strand seeks to narrow it down and confine its applicability strictly to the economy. The other, presented by figures like Lukács, see in Marx a double movement of theory, a suggestion at the first level, worked out in detail regarding the operation of the logic of mutual estrangement and crisis in the capitalist economy. But it contains a more general suggestion at a second level of similar substructures and similar logics that can operate in other parts of the modern society. <coughs> For instance, in the state and bureaucracy, which Weber and Lukács uh, described to some extent, in those instances, the primary task of the theorist is to adopt this general line and supply the details by working through the specific complexities of that particular structure, the structure that he is trying to analyze. When Marxist thinkers seek to develop a theory of the state, they face a choice, either reduce the operations of the structure of the state to reductive obedience to the impulses and determinations of the economy, or, like Lukács in his best moments, develop a body of theoretical insights specific to the sphere he is trying to explain. Nehru, I want to suggest, does something similar in principle about the structure of the international political order. Going back to the earlier argument that there are two ways of conceiving the international order, as an accident, accidental series of utterly consistent crises, or as a structure with internal logics which intensify and create periodic systemic failures, would help us see clearly that generally, Western states and Nehru worked on significantly different conceptions of the post-war world, world order and therefore of the UN system. For the West, which generally does not recognize the presence of a world capitalist order of systematic domination, the UN was a firefighting machine. For Nehru, its utility lay in the promise of its acting as a crucial mechanism in altering the nature of the conflictual and unjust 
world order. Thus, Western diplomatic missions and Krishna Menon, Nehru's longtime ambassador to the UN, worked with entirely different conceptions of what the machine they were working with was really like. Whatever the historical interest of that exchange that lasted for a quarter of a century after the start of the slow, difficult, and violent process of decolonization, <coughs> we must not forget the brutalities of the French in Vietnam and Algeria and the expostulations offered for racist governments and apartheid by British and American administrations. Men Menon's irritating and irritable presence in reminding, uh, persistence in reminding Western states about the high principles they supposedly valued contained, I think, an important theoretical idea. This idea was that the extensions of the global economy and lines of political power have created an international political order which bears exactly the same character of being a contradictory structure. People once subjected to colonial rule and their erstwhile rulers might not want to have anything to do with each other, but the past imprisoned them in a poisoned connection across which it was very hard to really cooperate because the basic, their basic stances had very little in common. The co in the verb cooperate was vacuous. They had to cooperate from opposite sides, from inelectable positions of oppositional interest. Global diplomacy with the UN as its ineffectual but iconic cipher, had to deal with this structure that exists in contradiction. <coughs> there is a simple problem with simple globalization theories today. They simply miss the contradictory character of that process and its intensification. Occasionally, in the Trump election or Brexit, it becomes clear that ordinary people suddenly realize the intensification of these processes had caused large devastation to human lives. But the trouble is that these actors decide to intensify the logic further and seek to win it as Trump is never tired of saying. But it is a structure. The other side cannot be destroyed without destroying the premises of your own current existence. The Chinese cannot be destroyed. The Chinese need the US market as much as US Trump voters need Chinese goods if they're not to fall into dire consumption poverty. But the problem <coughs> in which Nehru's example is relevant has become more urgent today. Nehru's foreign policy was consistently anti-imperialist in the sense in which this idea was understood during his time. Western government policies found his policies irritating and his positions intransigent. They preferred the more pliable elites of Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, which neither spoke their language nor lectured them upon their own principles. Continuing injustices of the international system today have wrought astonishing transformations of that situation. Even Imran Khan, whose entirely deserved fame as a fast bowler has been converted into a totally undeserved eminence, I think, as a politician, speaks the language of a primitive anti-imperialism. Gradually, however, the political role, I think this is something which really worries me. <coughs> Gradually, however, the political role of anti-imperialist opposition has shifted to figures who are entirely unlike Nehru and Krishnamanan. Figures rather like Saddam Hussein, uh, whom the British radical George Galloway once saluted as the great anti-imperialist figure, or Osama bin Laden. Actually, the efficacy of their anti-imperialism has been pitifully meager, if you look at it from that point of view. Killing Americans in the Twin Towers or in the streets of London and Paris has little efficacy in forcing change on policy of the Western states or economies. Nehru managed to steer one of the largest countries of the world away from economic submission to the dictates of world Western capitalist structures and form the base of an economy which has, at least temporarily, the fastest growth in the world. I wanted to add a section which is in the long paper but not in the summary. <clears throat> I think <coughs> it is here that there's a very big difference between the older Marxist resolution of the problem and Nehru. The Marxist resolution, the conventional Marxist resolution was to observe this contradiction and to try to resolve it by the dis destruction of the other side through a revolution. But we, if we abandon the dimension of the argument, we have to put increased value on what Krishna Menon did um, as Nehru's representative in the UN to recognize that this contradictory structure remains and it needs a discursive mechanism through which, which allows sharp arguments um, and his institutional framework that allows this conflict to play out without falling into violence. I think that is the central uh, message that I get out of Nehru's handling of <coughs> foreign policy generally. As long as the dominance of the West continues, the opposition to it will continue as well. <coughs> 
What is, remarkably is, uh, what is remarkable is how a form of discursive exchange through sharp diplomatic negotiations centered on the UN has now been replaced by desultory exchanges of pure violence and the war against terrorism on a world scale. The major substitution, I think, is profoundly significant. Anti-imperialist fighters do not require arguments on or their refinement. Only crude bombs, which kill people at random, alienate Western common sense, justifiably, render whole communities of Western Muslims suspect in the eyes of their compatriots. Western governments do not have to spin out counter-arguments against compelling arguments coming from their adversaries in the uh, global system against global injustice, but simply find adequate military means to destroy terrorism where it erupts and surveillance to preempt domestic terrorists. This is a vast shift from the 1940s, <coughs> when Western powers generally had to deal with intellectual arguments of anti-colonial nationalists like Gandhi and Nehru, and political movements against their institutional power. The situation is not entirely bleak, however. In the margins of the great theater of the war against terrorism, both sides, you know, both the terrorists and the governments. Discursive mechanisms of contradictory exchange, in my sense, which is essentially derived from the Hegel Marx understanding of the world, continue to function. Not surprisingly, in the context of the UN, like the WTO, like the climate exchanges agreements, the climate change agreements, etc. But there has been a strange transformation, which I think <coughs> we intellectuals should ponder. The contradictory conception of the modern world has been surreptitiously replaced by a misleading model of simplistic cooperation by new liberal conceptions of globalization. Unfortunately, the globalized elites of the other countries who have become co parsonaries of this highly uneven pros prosperity, starting from Chinese princelings to management educated heirs of Indian business families, have accepted that simplistic picture. Another insidious consequence is that the task of following on the contradictory picture of the world order has devolved to more practical intellectuals, in fact, intellectuals in Gramsci's sense. That's why I think Gramsci's conception of intellectual is so valuable. And in cases like this, I think we have to look for intellectual function among people who do not have intellectual roles always in society. <coughs> so contradictory picture of the world has devolved to more practical intellectuals like bureaucrats. Ironically, it's more likely that a bureaucrat from the Indian finance ministry would be using theorems from this view in his WTO negotiations, while academic intellectuals of the fiercest radical persuasion would spend time showing their skills at disambiguating obscurities in Derrida's thinking about language, and would feel unmoved by figures like Nehru. He seems to have been rendered obsolete by academic radicalism as well, which sometimes finds deep truths in Gandhi and Ambedkar, but regards Nehru as dull and uninteresting. But there's something disappointing in those celebratory exercises very often. On close reading, we find that Gandhi's or Ambedkar's ideas need to be ennobled by translations into either Derrida or Benjamin before they qualify for academic reverence. And we remain uncertain about whether it is real regard for Indian thinking or an ineradicable reverence for Western theory that drives these analyses. I remain convinced that the Hegel-Marx theory about the contradictory nature of modernity was correct. There is no modernity that is singularly or uniformly experienced by all its inhabitants. This experience is irreducibly disjunctive. As long as these structures dominate our lives, we shall need theoretical views from the other side of modernity, which we represent, while dealing with the questions of injustice of the international political and economic order. These elaborations of theory would need to be developed out of deep engagement with the underlying theoretical insights of figures like Nehru or Gandhi or Ambedkar. In reading these figures, like Nehru, Gandhi, or Ambedkar, we often realize that we are in the presence of powerful theoretical intuitions, but the task of theorizing is inadequate or unperformed. Theory does not always have to come from the West. If we can develop a subtler sight that can recognize theoretical ideas when they speak in an ordinary, non-philosophical language. Thank you. Thank you very much. I won't say very much other than I think uh, you've seen in Sudipta's talk an example of, of just how much richness and provocation still is there to be elicited in Nehru's thought. And if anything's going to spur me on to finish that damn book, it's <laughs> lectures like this, Sudipta. So, so thank you very much. Um, 
Also, just to assure you, the text will be available uh, on our website uh, in, in, in due course. Um, come and join us now for a glass of wine and uh, more questions and discussion uh, arising from all of that. Thank you once again.